entitled my talk for tonight The Feminine Approach to Spirituality uh, for two reasons. First of all, because I'm female, so obviously my approach must be feminine. And secondly also, to give it some connection with the uh, seminar that we had yesterday where we were talking about this aspect of the spiritual life. And as a third reason, because I think it is important that we realize that even though in the ultimate sense, in the completely ultimate sense, we are nothing but phenomena and in another not quite so ultimate sense we are just human beings yet because of our either being male or female we have taken on certain characteristics and approaches in daily life which have come about to some extent through our environment, through our upbringing, but also through our way of thinking about ourselves. And naturally, there is a difference between how a woman and how a man thinks about him or herself that this is not the ultimate reality is quite uh, certain but all of us at this point in time are living in a relative reality in the relative reality in which we believe in me this is me this is mine I am a certain person I'm a woman or a man I'm a wife or a husband a mother or a father I'm a daughter, I'm a, a teacher or a scientist. We have all sorts of identifications in which we believe and which give us our ego support. And because we live there at that point, that's where we have to start from if we want to do spiritual practice. Because we can't start at the end and work towards the beginning it's got to be right where we're at and then as we practice we will lose some of these identifications until at the very end we can see ourselves in an absolute and totally removed from identification manner I mentioned yesterday and I think I'll say that again, that all of us have both the male and the female within us. We have the, what is commonly considered to be the female side, which is the right side of the brain, and the male side, the left side of the brain, and they are in charge of the vice versa sides of the body. And the female in us is considered to be the one with feelings, with um, concern, nurturing, uh, caring, emotions, and the male side in us, the rational, logical one, the one that's thinking and uh, considering. Now, with that kind of possibility within each of us, it is naturally of the greatest importance on a spiritual path that we cultivate both aspects to the point where we have a balance within which makes us independent from other people. We don't have to lean or uh, use other people to make us complete. It is therefore necessary that we find out within ourselves which part of us is more lacking. 
whether we are not in touch with our feelings or whether we find it difficult to think rationally, logically, and think a matter through to its very end in total objectivity. It's not easy to think in total objectivity, but it can be done. Now, whichever part of us seems to be the one that we're lacking more, that's where we need to start with. However, the thinking aspect of us, our thinking procedure, will only become really clear when we purify our emotions. The formula for that is purification of emotion brings clarification of thought. Now that can easily be understood if you look at a simile of an ocean. If you have ocean waves which are going high, it is impossible to look below the surface of the sea to see what is underneath because everything is churned up and the only thing we can see are the waves, the water, and the waves with the foam. But if these waves subside and the ocean becomes quite smooth and calm, we will be able to look beneath the surface and see the sand and the coral and the fish and the shells. The same is with the mind. When the emotions are churning in the mind and there is a great deal of passionate reaction, either wanting, liking, and craving, or disliking, rejecting, then we can't see anything except those passions. And our thinking is totally overburdened with those emotions. The thinking has no objectivity. It's totally subjective. It is totally attuned to those emotions. When that has calmed down, when the emotions have become purified and there's calmness, then we can see some reality. We can be objective and think straight. We even use that simile in our language. I can't think straight right now too excited or too worried or too fearful. The purification of emotions is well designated by the Buddha. He says that there are only four kinds of emotions which are worthwhile keeping, cultivating, developing. All other emotions we may as well try to get rid of. They are loving-kindness, compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. And it is primarily the first one that we need to come to terms with. The other three fall into place much easier. It's the first one that we need to find out more about. The Buddha also said at another point, just as a mother at the risk of life loves and protects her child, her only child, so one should cultivate this boundless love to all that live in the whole universe. Now here he uses the mother as a symbol for the kind of love that we need to develop in our hearts. And because this is a a way of feeling and, and an emotional aspect with which women are very familiar, I was calling it the feminine approach to spirituality. This by no means means that the men can't do it. On the contrary, it is just as um, open to them as to any woman. But here the, uh, the uh, mother symbol is being used. And since all of us 
have had mothers, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We at least know that from our own personal experience, how the mother cared and was concerned when we were small. We may have had arguments, no end of them, in later years, but when small, we are totally dependent upon her work and her goodwill. And we are also very deeply connected because there is a very strong bonding. A mother carries the baby around for nine months. The baby is part of the mother's body and that alone is enough to make such a strong bonding so that it is rare to find a woman that does not have that deep feeling to look after an infant to the extent of not looking after herself. That's why the Buddha says, just as a mother at the risk of life, her own life, loves and protects. Now with that kind of symbol, we also know, particularly if we have children of our own, that with that love comes, comes enormous attachment. Every mother is very much afraid that something may happen to the child. I have never met a mother yet who has been spared that anxiety. Because the bonding is so strong and the child seems to be an extension of the mother herself, therefore the anxiety and the fear for the loss of the child through accident, death, sickness is so great. Now that is not what the Buddha is talking about. He's talking about the feeling, but he's talking about the fact that we should feel like that to all in the universe. Now, naturally, we cannot be anxious and afraid for everybody in the universe. We cannot want to keep everyone in the universe at our side. Such a thing is not possible. So, although the symbolism of the mother's love has within it this complete care and concern, it stops right there. Because the Buddha also said that naturally the uh, far enemy of this love is hate. It's easy to see and to know. But the near enemy is affection. And that is not easy to see and to know because affection seems to be love. But what it is, it's love coupled with attachment. And this is, of course, the second step of mother love, this attachment, wanting to keep the child and wanting to keep the child beyond reason even. So the affection is that the affection love is the kind of love which all of us have known at some time or another. Even it may have been brief, but everybody has had an experience of it. Either when small with the mother, when falling in love with somebody, or having one's own children. Everybody has had some experience of this. This is the kind of love we have in the family. And because, especially, the mother is concerned with that and is very much um, wants to express that also as part of the daily life. Therefore, it is something which is familiar to all women and must be familiar to men even if they're only on the receiving end. If we haven't had that as a personal experience, then it is not due to the fact that there was nobody there. It is due to the fact that we haven't got in touch with our own feelings. Now, this experience that we all know about the affection love is a kind of thing that is, 
can be used as a seedbed. Because it is our personal experience, it is something that we know. Nobody has to explain it to us. Nobody has to explain what it feels like. We know what it feels like. And we also know that in many instances, we have felt it to be a very important part of our lives. If it is with concerned about one's own children, one knows that it has been a very important part, but always coupled with anxiety. If it is with a partner, one knows that this is also a very important part of one's life. And many people are unwilling to live without that kind of feeling, particularly because they think this is the only way one can get it that kind of feeling. But this is a mistaken view. This affection love, which has the attachment, is directed towards one person, or maybe three or four, if there are many people in the family, or five, or something like that, particularly one or two. And it is dependent upon the presence of the other person. It's dependent upon the goodwill of the other person. It's dependent upon the reciprocal an arrangement so that the other person also loves. Now, to have love in one's heart with that many dependencies can not possibly bring peace because we know, all of us know underneath, that nothing is permanent. Whatever it is that we have, it can all disappear immediately. And if not immediately, maybe later. To be dependent upon one other person, to be dependent upon that other person's goodwill, their presence, and their uh, reciprocating our feelings is a very limiting and um, very dangerous way of expressing and having love in one's heart. It is so limiting when, when we remember that there are five billion human beings on this planet and we've got to have one. <laughs> and if that one isn't there, then sometimes that's considered to be a great tragedy. So what the Buddhist um, symbolism for the mother's love is, is that our care and concern, which we know, should extend to others. Now, naturally, it sounds like a truism. But one needs a little bit of uh, guidance also how to do that. If one has one's own children, one knows very well that one is far more interested in one's own children than, for instance, in one's neighbor's children, and far more interested in their well-being than in anybody else they are on the top of the list of priorities. And yet the Buddha says, everybody should be on the top of the list of priorities. So the first step that we can take is to check within ourselves whether we have loving feelings and whether we are extending them to certain people only. And if that is the case, which is the case in most people's lives, then we can try and reduce our dependency, our attachment to those people, so that we make room for others. If we have complete attachment to certain people who are the only important ones in our lives, then there's no room. Everything is full of them. We have no space left in our heart to let others in. And our whole situation in the world, in the way people act, is usually that we only let those in who we approve of. <clears throat> and the reason we approve of them is based upon some arbitrary ideas that we have. It may be based upon 
their looks, the way they talk, or the way they approve of us. But that is not the way to transcend our human difficulties. Our difficulties that we have as human beings are the same for everybody. We don't get what we want, and we get what we don't want. And we can't solve it by trying to get more. But we can solve it by getting our heart purified to the point where it isn't anymore a certain person or persons, but it is a matter of the heart. It is the cultivation of our own quality which has absolutely nothing to do with who is in front of one. Now this is the ideal and naturally there are many steps on the way which we have to take little by little but at least we can know where it can lead to. It isn't a question whether another person is lovable. It isn't a question whether another person loves us. It's not a question of whether another person wants to be loved. It is only a question of what we're doing with our own heart. That's all that matters. And what we're doing with our own heart, if we practice and are on a spiritual path, is to reduce the negativity the hates, the angers, the fears, and the anxieties, and respond with what the Buddha calls metta, and which we have nothing better to translate it with than loving kindness. It is the kind of lovingness which does not attach itself to anyone or anything. Now, this purification process necessitates that we first know what goes on in our feelings. We know when we are loving and kind, and we know when we're not. And all of us do both. So when we're loving and kind, we can also immediately feel contentment. We feel contented and peaceful within. When we are not when we are either worried or fearful, anxious, disliking, rejecting, envious, then we don't feel peaceful within. We feel churned up. And when we feel churned up like that, we also can't think straight because our emotions are taking over. And I think probably everyone has, at one time or another, experienced just that. If we're in touch with our feelings. So the pathway to becoming a whole human being, which means that we are cultivating our femininity and our masculinity, the feeling and the thinking side, is to purify our emotional life. And this emotional life is constantly in danger because our contacts with other people, and this is where our emotions are mostly aroused, are never guaranteed. We can never guarantee that the next person we meet is going to be nice. We can never guarantee that the next person we meet is going to approve of us. We can't know whether they're going to like us. So we can never try to use that as a criteria. All we can do is work on the reactions that we have ourselves. And as we have these reactions, we are usually justifying them. Usually when we don't like somebody, we justify it by saying he's awful or she's awful. That's the reason not to like them, naturally. But it doesn't give us any happiness and it doesn't purify us. And their, their viewpoints, their opinions are stupid. Well, they may very well be. But that doesn't help us. 
The only thing that helps us is if we do not take into consideration who, why, where, and when that person is, but if we only take into consideration that we are trying to lead a spiritual life, we ourselves, and what the other person does, that will be their affair. So if we are trying to transcend human difficulties and foibles, it's up to us to purify our own emotions. And the justification for our dislike are illusions. Even if another person hates us, and why shouldn't they? I mean, hate is rampant in the world. And if we happen to be in the, in the pathway, we may become the target. And the more visible one is, the more of a target one becomes. The Buddha was also hated. And uh, Jesus was even killed with hatred. So such a thing is in everybody's life. But the Buddha said, hate is never conquered by hate. Hate is conquered by love alone. Now, often people say to that statement that one cannot always give in. One cannot always um, uh, just step back from injustice. It doesn't mean that at all. Love has to be coupled with wisdom. It doesn't mean that we no longer recognize injustice, that we no longer recognize a falsehood, that we no longer know when things are wrong. We do. We would be foolish if we didn't. <clears throat> the Buddha certainly did not advocate foolishness. On the contrary, the three steps on the Buddhist path are moral behavior, meditation, and wisdom. But when we see the injustice, when we see the wrongdoings, and if we feel equipped and uh, capable of doing something about them, we can do something. But we do not hate the person who is doing the wrong thing, nor the wrong thing in itself. The hatred which will arise in us will make us much less effective if we want to do something. Just as a mother with a child, children are constantly doing wrong things. They're spilling their food when they're on a clean <coughs> floor. They, they answer back uh, when they're supposed to be quiet. They're always doing wrong things. They're spending money when they're supposed to save it. And everything they do can be construed to be something that the mother wouldn't be doing. But it doesn't change the love of the mother at all. If she feels that she may be able to change the matter, she may talk to the child about it, if the child is still young enough to listen. If the child is too old, of course, no words would do anything. <coughs> but the love remains the same. And this is the exact way that we need to learn to react to all the wrong things that happen in the world. Now, not in every instance are we able to be effective, but there are maybe areas where we can do something if we feel that we have the necessary knowledge, know-how, and connections to do something. Certainly, why not? But only with love in the heart. Love for the people who are doing whatever they're doing because they are human beings who are having dukkha, which means unsatisfactoriness in their lives, who are looking for happiness, who are deluded just as we all are because we do not see absolute reality. Now, if that kind of stance and inner feeling was propagated in the world more and more, we would find that people would be able to get along with each other. This is a difficulty we have. People don't get along with each other. They can superficially get along with each other for one evening. I'm sure we're not going to start yelling at each other. But to live with each other, most people find it fairly difficult, not only just with um, uh, a lot of people, but even with one person. And why is that? Because we find it difficult to live with ourselves. And here we come to a very important point, namely to the point that we must learn to love ourselves. 
in the same way as a mother loves her own child. Now that kind of love, if it's a sensible mother, has to be coupled with wisdom. Now if a child is offered the lunch and the child only wants to eat the ice cream and not the vegetables, and the mother says, no, no, you must eat the vegetables. And the child puts up a big fight and screams and yells and a big to-do about it. But the mother, in wisdom, will not give in to that. She'll say, no, no, you must have that first and then that. That means she does it out of love because the child has to have the decent food to grow. So if we have that kind of love for ourselves, it doesn't mean that we're going to indulge ourselves. We're not just going to eat ice cream and no vegetables. <laughs> we're going to look after ourselves so that we can grow. Now, we're not going to grow physically anymore. We're all past that stage, I think. Um, but we all have to grow in our spiritual life. The total maturity in the spiritual life is nirvana or nibbana. I'm not going to go into that, what that means, because I think this is a little premature. <laughs> <coughs> but because we aren't there, it means that we still have to grow. And if we have the wisdom of a mother for her child, it means that we will look after that growth. And that Loving ourselves means that we do not berate ourselves, that we do not blame ourselves, that we do not act towards ourselves like a bad mother would, blaming the child for all sorts of things and not appreciating, not approving, giving, making it difficult for the child to love him or herself. So in this case, we have to be mother and child ourselves. We are most likely all past the point where our mothers are interfering in our lives. So we can only look after our interfering in our own lives. So this kind of love, if we have that for ourselves, it will naturally be a gener generating process towards others. Now it doesn't mean that we can tell others what to do. But it means that we have a nice relationship with ourselves. We have a kind of relationship where we feel at ease with ourselves, where we know that we're appreciating and approving of all the good things we do, that we're trying to do something about those things which we consider uh, wrong, that we consider not helpful, not beneficial, and we feel confident if we have made any attempt to do that and have been successful, we feel confident that we are on a spiritual growth path. This self-confidence plus the ease we have about ourselves make it possible that we go out from our heart to others without any feeling of that they've got to prove themselves first. Because this is what most people have in mind, that the other person has to prove him or herself first before we can extend any love. But that's totally unnecessary if we have that feeling about being at ease with ourselves already within us. Because then it's much simpler to extend that outward. So this is actually where it all starts, with oneself. We are the center of our world. Each one has their own world of which each one is the center. And when it starts with where that centerpiece is, in order, where the centerpiece is feeling quite at ease and happy. Then we have a, a way of seeing our world in a different viewpoint. The world does not look threatening the other people. The other people don't look as if they are um, um, strangers. They don't look as if they uh, might uh, do us any harm. They just look as if they are an extension of that, what we're feeling about ourselves. Now, as you may know, uh, in the Buddha,
Buddhist uh, um, concept, we talk about rebirth. Now, I'm not going to try to convince you of that, but um, rebirth means that we have been around many, many times. And if that is a fact, and if you can accept it, as some of you will, and some of you won't, which is quite all right, um, we can think of it also that the people that we have close contact with in this life may have all been our children in past lives. And it doesn't matter what age we are now right now. It doesn't matter at all because we don't all come back at the same time. So we can look upon it that if you can accept this particular concept and it makes it much easier because we, we always have reservations about others. And yet, if they've all been our children at one time or another, so maybe we didn't do such a good job in bringing them up. (laughs) That doesn't allow us not to love them. And if we have a stance like that, life becomes easier. We do not feel like we've got to um, only pick out those people that are really on our wavelength. It doesn't matter because our wavelength changes anyway all the time. So we don't have to make sure that this is happening. We don't have to uh, try and correct other people. We, unless there's a definite reason for it, we don't have to do anything. All we are concerned with is that our inner life becomes one of ease and harmony. If we do that, we have a certain, we have a certainty of a spiritual path, and we don't have to give that path a certain name either. It is a growth process, a maturing process, and naturally, this same thing. Although I'm speaking in feminine terms of mother, naturally, the same thing is open to all people, male and female, and. Particularly, we need to pay attention to the fact whether we are aware of feeling love or the opposite, hate, or whether there is a feeling of nothing in there. Now that, some people do have that. They just do not have any kind of awareness of what's going on inside. It's a lack of awareness. It's not a lack of feeling. We're all made exactly the same. And we can all have exactly the same growth process. Only some of us need different methods. I'll talk about a little bit about compassion. Now, the first one I've talked about in English, we call it loving kindness, although the word itself is sort of a weak word, and I prefer the word love. But on the other hand, the word love always conjures up a certain, uh, this affection love. So I try to make clear the difference between love and loving kindness. Now here, the next one is compassion. Its far enemy is cruelty. That's easy to see. But the near enemy is pity. And that's difficult to see. They're called near enemies because they are so similar. Pity seems to be very similar to compassion, but it is a near enemy because pity divorces itself from the other person. Pity has a stance almost like this. I'm so sorry for you, um, but it is like the other person is having all the difficulties and oneself is um, accepted. Whereas compassion... Just as the word implies, com means with, passion, feeling, is a with feeling, it's empathy. And it doesn't mean that if somebody is suffering, that we're going to start suffering with them. Because if we have one sufferer, that's already enough. We don't need two. But what it means is that we have already become aware of our own suffering, of our own unsatisfactory feelings, of our own lacks and difficulties, 
and have in already taken some steps to overcome that. And when another person has a difficulty, we recognize it. We can recognize that and say, yes, I know that one. I've had it and I've done such and such with it. In other words, it is not starting to suffer with the other person, but it is an understanding of the feeling and being able to identify with the difficulty and show the way out. The best example of that is the well-known in Buddhist um, stories, well-known Buddhist story about uh, Kisa Gotami, who was a woman, I'll tell it briefly, who was a woman who married late in life, was wanting a child very badly, and finally did have a little son who died at, and she was deliriously happy and the whole family finally accepted her which they hadn't done before because she wasn't pretty and she wasn't rich and nobody liked her but when she became of course the mother of the grandson everything was all right and uh, she was deliriously happy and he died at three years of age and then she was unable to accept that and she almost one can say she almost lost her mind. She carried the child around, the dead child, running from here to there, asking people to help her and give her some, find some medicine for her, find a doctor for her. And nobody wanted anything to do with her anymore because she was obviously out of her mind. So then one day, she again was doing that, and a man came along and said he would take her to a, a teacher who would explain it to her someone who would find a remedy for this child. So he, she, uh, he took her to the Buddha and she showed the child to the Buddha and said, can you give me a, a medicine for the child? And uh, the Buddha said, yes, I can give you medicine. So she was overjoyed and she said, yes, what is it? And he said, go to the um, nearest village and go to a house and ask for a handful of mustard seeds. She was just about to run off when he said, but you can only get the mustard seed from a house when nobody has died. So she went off and she went to the first house and asked for a handful of mustard seed. And uh, then when the woman brought the handful, she said, has anybody died in this house? And the woman said, yes, grandfather died recently. She said, I'm sorry, I can't take your mustard seed. So she went to the next house and again asked and the maid had died. And she went to the next house and the dog had died. And she went to the next house and the father had died. And she went to the whole village. She came to the last house. Again, somebody had died. And then it dawned on her that it was impossible to find a house where nobody had died. So she went back to the Buddha and said, now it's all right to bury the child. So in his compassion, which is what the Buddha, of course, had in perfection, he did not try to resurrect the child and bring it back to life because it's going to die again. He did not try to um, um, get her over her grief by uh, saying, oh, you can have another child or something like that. He showed her the truth because he had got over being attached to and wanting other beings. So he showed this woman the truth that everybody has to die. And she was able to accept that. So when we have true compassion, it comes because we have seen our own suffering and have found a way of overcoming that suffering. And then we can be extremely um, helpful to other people because people do need someone to talk to and have... Um, an, a listener. To be a good listener is loving kindness. To give one's attention to others is loving kindness. To um, not be concerned with oneself but with their troubles, all that is love for others. Compassion is sometimes easier to arouse than this love for others because it's sometimes easier to have compassion for someone who is having great difficulty 
because we have that feeling of uh, uh, that could be me. So we want to help. And from that compassion, just say a few words about equanimity. And that is um, an aspect of our emotional makeup which is um, difficult to develop and mostly misunderstood. The far enemy, of course, is anxiety, restlessness, worry, but the near enemy is indifference. Indifference is a kind of attitude where we don't really want to know about other people. We really don't want to know about ourselves either because it's going to be hurtful and we cut ourselves off inside, not outside, and our feeling capacity is impaired. We don't know exactly what we're feeling. Indifference doesn't have any loving kindness in it. It has a certain coldness about it. But it is primarily noticeable only to the person who has it because it can be easily mistaken for equanimity. And it is noticeable to the person who has it, if they really take the trouble to do so, by realizing that they haven't got that feeling of connection with other beings. And this is something that we gain through our meditative practice, that we realize one day through meditation, that this idea of limit of our body and limit of our personal mind is a fantasy. That we are actually part of a whole universe in which there are so many other beings which are impinging upon us and to whom we have actually no separate existence. And when that happens in meditation, it becomes so much easier to have love and compassion for others. Because when we realize that we're just a speck in a mass, which is actually us, then there's no reason anymore to dislike or be indifferent to us ourselves. Equanimity, real equanimity, has to be based on insight into that particular aspect of uni the universe that there is no real limit to us that we are actually the whole thing and that the whole thing is us and it is also needs the understanding of complete and total change which is happening every moment because what is right and what is happening now will not happen again in the same way a few minutes later. So whatever it is that is getting us riled up, excited, worried, anxious, hateful, it's all going to change. By the same token, everything that, is going, that makes, gives us a pleasant feeling and delights us is also going to change. So this is actually the inherent unsatisfactoriness of human existence that there's nothing we can put our finger on and say, I'm going to keep this one. It just isn't possible. And if that is seen, not known, but seen within oneself, equanimity can arise. Equanimity is considered by the Buddha to be the epitome of our emotions. It is the desired state which is needed in order to see reality because it is that calmness of the ocean which I talked about where the waves are no longer disturbing this um, uh, smooth um, water and there is no nothing that impinges upon our clarity of thought. So if we purify through seeing everyone as our children gaining a little glimpse of the fact that we're not alone but that everybody is part of our lives. If we see a way of overcoming our own difficulties and can impart that to others, then a great deal of 
evenness will arise in our emotional makeup and then clarity of thought is no longer difficult. With this pathway, which I have outlined, we have an approach to the spiritual life which I think is possible for everyone because these emotions are known to us but we need to cultivate and develop them more. I think I would like to stop now and give you a chance to uh, say something and uh, ask, argue, add, agree, disagree, whatever you like. Say your name first. Stephen. Right. Mm. Um, the importance of the people talk about of contacting anger, mm-hmm. and expressing that. Yeah, contacting is okay, expressing no. <laughs> I know that this is part of Western therapy. And um, as far as it goes, it's all right. I know, I have some friends in Sydney, and uh, he does this and he has a little soundproof room and it's mm-hmm. all uh, covered in mattresses, the walls and the floor, and if you are furious, you can go in there and scream and pound the walls. That's all right, as far as it goes, you might get rid of this particular anger at that moment. But unfortunately, unless you do some changing within yourself, you're going to get angry again. So you have to keep going back to that little room. I mean, it's not really satisfactory, you know. And um, so the contact with anger is absolutely important. We have to know what we're feeling. But the Buddha said no expression and no repression. Understanding it and then transforming it. Using it to transform it. Now, if we meditate, for instance, we know that we let go of our thinking and substitute with the meditation subject, the breath. Right. With anger, we can do the same thing. If we have learned to substitute, to let go and substitute, then we can do that right there. If we're, for instance, angry at another person, which is usually what happens, huh? where, it, where it's meaningful, the anger at another person, then if that person is known to us, we can at that particular moment try to remember anything nice that person has ever done or ever said. Now, if we are already so angry that we can't remember anything like that, then we can think, for instance, that that person also has a mother who loves him or her. If that doesn't help us, then we we can think that if I'm going to get angry now, I'm only going to feel awful. It's going to be my, uh, the result and it's going to be for me. The Buddha compared getting angry with picking up hot coals with one's bare hands and trying to throw them at somebody else. (laughs) 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 So if we can, if we have enough presence of mind to not not to react instinctively, impulsively, and have enough uh, ability to wait a moment and uh, look at ourselves, we can see that this anger we're going to express is only going to make us feel awful because we never have anybody felt happy after being angry. They think that they have unloaded something, but what have they done? They have unloaded the rubbish and tried to heap it on somebody else, but the other person may be wise enough not to accept the rubbish. There's a nice story about the Buddha when he was giving a talk like this and uh, <clears throat> there, were, there was a Brahmin there and he was walking up and down in front of the Buddha while he was talking, which in itself was already not very polite. And finally the Buddha had sort of a, made a pause and uh, then the Brahmin started abusing the Buddha and saying that he was telling, teaching the wrong doctrine and that he should be chased out of the country because he was getting the young men away from the families to follow him as monks. And it was uh, very abusive, very, very using very um, uh, bad language. And after he ran, the Buddha sat there and waited. <clears throat> and as he finally ran out of things to say, Buddha said to him, Brahman, 
Do you ever have guests in your house? And the Brahmin said, certainly we have guests in our house. And uh, Buddha said, and uh, when they come, do you offer them hospitality? Do you give them food and drink? And uh, the Brahmin said, certainly we offer them food and drink. And uh, Buddha said, and what happens if they don't accept your hospitality, don't take your food and drink? Uh, to, whom, to whom does it belong then? And the Brahmin said, well, it belongs to me, of course. The Buddha said, that's right, Brahmin, it belongs to you. If somebody is getting angry and throws abuse, if one doesn't feel that it is necessary to pick it up, it's there. So the same way with us, if we start throwing abuse at somebody else, it may rain down on our own head. So it needs presence of mind, it needs what we call mindfulness, it needs that moment of consideration between the, the reaction and the, the feeling and the reaction. And if we have that, sense, certainly we can develop it. It's a matter of learning that. And the best way to develop it is through meditation. All right, what else? Yes. Uh, uh, you said there were four kinds of good emotions, like I remember two of them, uh, loving kindness and compassion. Would you please tell me what the other two are? Yes, well, I didn't talk about one of them. I didn't talk about joy with others. It's joy with others. Mm -hmm. And the last one I did talk about is equanimity. I thought it was getting late, so I left the third one out. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit about it now? I have another hand up. <laughs> Robbie. Oh, I don't mind. <laughs> I thought maybe you would like to say yeah. things. Go ahead, say whatever you want to say. No, I, I, was, uh, I was just going to ask you if you'd speak a little about protecting one's own happiness. Oh, yes. <coughs> well, to protect one's own happiness means that one has to protect one's own emotional state. And that doesn't mean that one has to protect oneself from others. See, to protect oneself from others is an impossibility because anything can trigger a negative reaction. One has to protect oneself from one's own negative reactions. And that protection means that one practices what the Buddha calls the four supreme efforts, which means that one has at one's command, after some practice, that one doesn't let in those emotions and those thoughts which are negative and unwholesome and do not give one happiness. And uh, every time it happens that one um, replaces them with something wholesome. So the protection that we need for our own happiness is something that goes on within. Now, there are situations in life, and I think most people have come across them, where one is together with a person in some manner or form, either at work or even in a, in a community or living in a house or something, and this person triggers unwholesome emotions in oneself over and over and over. And one cannot do anything about it. Then one has to admit to oneself that one just isn't advanced enough yet in one's spiritual quest to be able to change those reactions and avoid it, go away. The Buddha said one needs to be together with those people who are wise and mature and help one on the path. Now naturally such a person who triggers constant negative reactions is very helpful on the past because one can see that one has these negative reactions but one may not be able to cope with it. If one is unable to cope, one has to give in and say, I'm sorry, I can't cope. Maybe two years later I'll try again and maybe then I'll be able to cope. Now the people who trigger unwholesome reactions in us are our best teachers, naturally but we can't always accept the teaching. And so protecting our own happiness means that we're protecting our own thoughts and feelings from being unwholesome, quite independent of the fact what the triggers are. This is a very important point, that we must remember that 
what happens around us are the triggers. Whatever we've got in here, that's being triggered. And it isn't the fault of the trigger. It's our own stuff that we've got that is being coming out. But as I said, if it comes to the point where we can't cope, we'll have to avoid. I I feel really discursive here. What about um, a person who acts as a trigger to nearly everybody that person meets? I have met um, a person like this. The person is a trigger to nearly everybody. Yes, well, <laughs> it's a, a, maybe somebody could help that person by, uh, in some manner or form, that is a trigger for everybody. But other than that, that uh, means that everybody's got to learn something. <laughs> I always like to compare that with the um, little toy that children have um, I don't know the name of the toy right now it's in a box and there's a little doll sitting on a jack in the box that's it there's a little doll sitting on a spring and the box has a lid and if the child just touches the lid very lightly the jack in the box jumps out so now we take the jack in the box away and the child touches the lid, nothing happens. The child takes a hammer and hammers the lid, nothing happens. If the jack in the box in here is taken away, nothing happens. No matter who triggers it. But because we have it in here, we have hate, we have greed, we have all that in here, and it is being triggered and we haven't been able to, you know, uh, purify it completely, there are situations where we have to avoid. But mostly the situations are the greatest learning experience we can ever find, if we can use them that way. And this is another thing, that in our life situation, if we look at our whole life from birth to death, as an adult education class, then we're looking at it rightly. That's what it is. It's an adult education class. Every obstacle that's put in our way is another learning experience and sometimes no, always uh, it happens so frequently that we get put in front of the same situation four times five times six times until it finally dawns on us this is the way it's been before i'm reacting in the same way maybe i should change that's it yes <laughs> It's an adult education class where we are getting put back in the same class if we haven't learned the lesson. Yes, Alan. Hi, my name is Alan Deacon. Um, I want to ask a question about spontaneity. Um, the, the, the implication is that uh, spontaneous responses of our own is um, all part of our sort of socialized behavior. It's not part of our, our true being to a large degree. Um, in therapy, um, maybe it's not in Western type therapy, spontaneity is encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, like anger, spontaneous anger, for instance. But in, as you're saying, in Buddhism, it's suggested that uh, we watch our reaction and don't react straight away. Yes. Uh, we watch our negative feelings. If you have a positive feeling of loving somebody, go right ahead and, and, and do it. But um, uh, the spontaneity that we usually have is instinctive and impulsive. And instinctive in this sense. We have our sense contacts. We see, we hear, we taste, touch and smell and think. All these contacts create feeling. There's nothing to do about it. They do. We can't stop that. Whether we are aware of the feeling or not doesn't matter. And from the feeling comes the reaction, which is either I don't like it, I don't want it, or I like it and I want it. It's called craving in Buddhist terminology because it means both. So that's a completely pre-programmed reaction, which unless we become aware of it and break into that circle one day, we will go on doing over and over and over. And that's how we get the same situations in front of us and our same reactions again and again. 
Now that is not really spontaneity, that is instinctive impulsive. It is almost like um, these um, Pavlos dogs. But what we can do is we can become aware of our feelings, and this is what I'm advocating, this getting in touch with one's feelings, really knowing the feeling. And if one is in touch with the feeling and knows the feeling, one doesn't have to respond to it instantaneously or instinctively, but one has a choice. And when we make a choice, which way we want to react, and all this goes very, very quickly, of course, then we become master of our own situation. Now, I can react with, to this by choice, by either saying, well, I don't like this, I don't want anything to do with it, or I can say it, it's all right, you know, by choice. But if I do it sp- uh, immediately, it's not <coughs> spontaneity. Spontaneity is something else, namely, it is coupled with absolute mindfulness. If there's absolute mindfulness, total attention to the moment, one can spontaneously react in a manner which is objective and not colored by like or dislike. But it's difficult to find this mm-hmm. um, so difference. The between the male and female that you're talking about, you using the right side and the left side of the brain, mm-hmm. having, having the feeling and then having it go through the intellect. Mm. It, uh, that happens. You see, first you have the feeling, then as you're reacting to the feeling, it does go through the mind. It goes, the mind reacts then with the like or the dislike. I don't want it or I do want it. But if we become aware of this feeling thing, then we have a choice of what we're going to do with it. And then the spontaneity which is, is desirable is based on complete attention, total attention, where there's no need to a waiver, am I going to do this or am I going to do that? There's total attention and an objective reaction, not a subjective reaction. So actually, what the, if, if this is what Western therapy is doing, they're confusing spontaneity with instinct. Yes, Robbie, you didn't tell your name yet. <laughs> Yes, but there's nothing to do with this, but I will. <laughs> the only one who doesn't create karma is an arahant fully enlightened. Everybody else, everybody else makes karma, but you may not be making the karma of, of the actual act. For instance, if you, have a, if you step on some ants on the pathway, you don't have the volition of killing, but uh, you're making karma of um, being negligent or not watching and not paying attention. So which is less than, you know, killing. So the only one who has makes no karma at all is the Arahant. Could you like step on an ant? Yes, but he doesn't, if he steps on an ant, it's not, he doesn't any longer have any person in there that could be making karma. That's finished. Nobody there. Being nobody going nowhere. Title of my new book. <laughs> It's for sale here, and uh, it's published by Wisdom Publications and uh, in England, and uh, it uh, costs $16. So if you're interested, it is a, contains the, um, a whole meditation course, a 10-day meditation course, uh, taken on tape and then transcribed. And if you're interested in it, um, Mrs. Bell here, uh, who is the president of this uh, society, will be ha- happy to take your money. Called being nobody going nowhere. <laughs> and the other thing that I also can mention at this point uh, is that there'll be a meditation course this weekend, starting Friday afternoon and finishing Sunday afternoon. And if anyone is interested who is here and hasn't yet uh, heard about it, they can also see Mrs. Bell about it. Right. You want to hear something about this joy with others, or does somebody else have something to say? Yes. My name is Margaret Trail. I um, often, in loving kindness meditation, I experience absolutely nothing. 
and it makes me feel very desolate. What can one do about something like that? Right. Um, well, we'll do loving kindness meditation in five minutes and uh, uh, see if anything happens. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what the real situation is. Um, you're not experiencing anything, but you're thinking the thought, right? That is being put to you. Okay. Thinking is another sense contact. And all sense contacts have feeling as a result. So. If you think it often enough, you get the feeling. And don't feel desolate because that's a negative, negative approach to yourself. Just say, well, at this particular time, I'm just thinking, it's okay. And as you keep on thinking, it will come, the feeling will come. And you can start thinking this also uh, sort of during the day sometimes, not just wait for the time for the meditation. So do think about it during the day to give it more of a chance. And, and don't think you're unique in that. There's so many people. Don't worry about it. It goes away. <laughs> like everything goes away. <laughs> Anything else? Well, what I would like to do then, rather than uh, discuss this uh, joy with others, because I think you've had enough discussion, we'll um, uh, do a loving-kindness meditation. And this is a kind of <coughs> meditative practice that anybody can do um, even for 10 minutes a day and you don't have to be a great meditator for it. Uh, it is a very useful way of using one's mind in the right direction. In order to get started, please put your attention on your breath for just a moment. How the breath goes in and out of the nostrils. And now think of yourself as your own mother and child. Think of yourself how a mother would think of her own child, caring and concerned, approving and appreciating, supporting, loving. Let these feelings arise in you, direct them towards yourself. And now think of the person that's sitting nearest you in this room as if he or she was your own child. And let all your feelings of care and concern and appreciation and love reach out to that person as if he or she was your own son or daughter. And now let this feeling of motherly love reach out to everyone here as if all these people here were your own sons and daughters, your own family, caring for them, concerned about them, loving them, appreciating them, supporting them. Reach out with these feelings to everyone here. Now think of your own parents 
as if they were your children, looking after them, caring for them, appreciative, supportive, loving and compassionate. Think of them as your son and daughter and let your feelings reach out to them. Think of those people who are closest to you. Think of them as your children. Be their mother. Caring, loving, approving, supporting. Embracing them like a mother embraces her children. Now think of your good friends and think of them as, they were, as if they were your children. You are their mother. You can look after them, care for them, appreciate, support. Let these feelings reach out to them. Let them know about it. Now think of your neighbors, the people at work, people that you meet in the shops, in the streets, those that you see occasionally, those that you know, and those that you only meet. Think of all of them as your children, as a big family. Let those feelings of motherly love reach out to all of them, wanting to help them wanting to support them, to appreciate them, to approve of them, care for them. Think of anyone with whom you may have had difficulties, who may have put obstacles in your path, maybe someone you don't like, and think of that person as your own child. Children often make difficulties. Let this motherly love reach out to that person so that there's no longer an obstacle in your own heart.
Let your heart grow and expand and let this love that you carry within reach out to as many human beings as possible, those you know and those you don't know. Try to expand as far as possible, thinking of all of them as your children, as your own family, the care and concern which goes far and wide and reaches out to beings everywhere. See whether your feelings can reach out first near, then further into the farthest distance. Embracing them all. So that they get to know that there's someone who cares. Put your attention back on yourself and feel that feeling of ease and well-being which comes from loving and giving, the contentment which arises when there's only purity in the emotion. Look at yourself with approval and appreciation. knowing that you're growing on the spiritual path. Enjoy that feeling of peace and joy. May beings everywhere love each other. <laughs> 